Okay, we're going to be jumping in chapter 3 of Judges 12 through 30, and there's going to be some graphic content here, so hang on, you'll get through it. So here we go, chapter 3, verse 12. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered himself, the Ammonites and Amalekites, and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab, and Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute, but he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he rose from his seat, and Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited till they were embarrassed, but when they, he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sarah, where he arrived, he sounded the trumpet, the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. Well, good afternoon. I, I think there is some kind of strange irony that the Sunday that a guy from Fremont is preaching, the word dung shows up in the Bible reading. If you know anything about Fremont, we have any kind of meat packing you can imagine, we have it. Uh, dog food, pork, beef tongue. We now have chickens. It's a great, great place to be from. Uh, wouldn't want to live there, but it's a great place to be from. I'm actually a native uh, free monster, as we like to be called, and uh, came back 10 years ago to plant Grace Church. And so uh, we, too, know the unique struggles and joys and trials of being a church plant, uh, particularly in a time of COVID in which you're trying to figure out where you meet. Let me just say uh, this evening, we are thankful for you all. Uh, there was a time in this city, uh, both my parents hail from Omaha, in which there were not a, a great number of Bible-believing churches in town. And so we're grateful for you. We are thankful for the impact that you are having. And I am thankful for your pastors. Uh, they are good guys in spite of themselves and, uh, and appreciate their faithfulness. It's been a joy to get to know them. Uh, I met Andrew when he was, you were an intern, right? When he was an intern at City Light and they were still uh, up the street. Uh, Jared, I've known his whole life. Literally, uh, my family, before we lived in Fremont, my dad uh, was a, 
an American history teacher and a football coach. And we lived in Atkinson, where Jared's family hails from. And so uh, in the fall of 1977, Jared's patient and loving father endeavored to try to teach me the piano. <laughs> it did not go very well, but he is a good and faithful man, and Phil and Kathy uh, have raised... What do you have, like 19 siblings or something like that? Yeah, uh, have raised a whole, by God's grace, a whole parcel of good and faithful children. Let me pray for us, and then let's give attention to this really unique story. Father, thank you for time together this evening. Lord, thank you for your gospel, which both calls us out of darkness and into light and also strengthens us and encourages us. Lord, these moments we have now before us are few, and yet we pray that you would use them for the building of your kingdom, for the encouraging and sustaining of your people, and that you would bring glory to your name through our time together. For we pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. We live amidst an easily offended culture. We have to be aware of triggers, safe spaces, and each other's sometimes ham-fisted attempts to live your or my truth. Mental health providers now lament our heightened levels of anxiety, our inability to cope with life in general, and our general emotional fragility. In such a time as this, the book of Judges seems like a rather odd choice. This is a book that requires, as we already heard, a trigger warning before we even read it. It's a book filled with gruesome violence, with wanton behavior, and old school thuggery. Every judge, with the exception of Deborah, is a poster child for toxic masculinity. There is fat shaming in our text for this afternoon. In fact, Judges is so problematic that it presents an issue for triggered evangelicals. One Old Testament commentator put it this way. He laments that our attitude towards Judges is this. If we read the epistles long enough, Judges might just go away. Well, I think we dislike Judges for another reason, however. As sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, as C.S. Lewis masterfully referred to the human race, we are experts at making ourselves the heroes of God's story. Amen. And so I fear the two that often offends us in Judges is not too much gruesome violence or too much fat shaming or too much toxic masculinity. No, I fear that Judges reminds us that God's people can indeed be a real mess. Not on the level of Tuesday night's presidential debate. <laughs> Actually, friends, we're worse than that. Thankfully, this is where God shines. For as our big idea tonight tells us, God sends an unlikely deliverer to his unrepentant people. God sends an unlikely deliverer to his unrepentant people. Now, if you're wondering, what is a big idea? A big idea, hopefully, in one sentence, is what the sermon is about. There was, a, we can't really comprehend this, but there was a point in time in which there was a president of the United States who was known as Silent Cal. His name was Calvin Coolidge. He said very little. Uh, his Twitter account, also shockingly, was fairly sparse and pretty quiet. Uh, Calvin Coolidge, uh, one Sunday, was, was a Presbyterian, so I take particular interest in him. But uh, Calvin Coolidge, uh, his wife one Sunday was not feeling well, so she sent him to church. He came back and over Sunday dinner asked her husband, what did the preacher uh, preach about that particular morning? His answer, sin. What did he say about sin? He was against it. <laughs> Friends, that's the big idea. In one hopefully short, 
I'd like to think pithy, but probably utterly forgettable sentence. This is what the sermon is about. God sends an unlikely deliverer to his unrepentant people. So three thoughts we want to hang our hats on this evening as we deal with Judges chapter 3. The first one is this. You need to channel your inner Chesterton. You need to channel your inner Chesterton. Now, don't worry if you don't know who G.K. Chesterton is. Jesus will forgive you. And I'll tell you who he is here in just a few moments. As we come to this story about the second of the six major judges that are uh, portrayed for us in the book of Judges, as we come to the text and we read about what's going on, we see what becomes a repeated theme in this book. Now, let's remember that the author of the book of Judges couldn't, uh, couldn't make bold type. He couldn't underline it. He couldn't change from 12-point font to 14-point font, as some of you do on papers when you don't have anything to say and there's a page requirement. He, do, he can't italicize it. So what he does is he uses repetition. And so in verse 12... And then again, in, at the beginning and the end of verse 12, we read the same thing. The people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So what does God do? God strengthens their oppressor. He strengthens their adversary. Why? Because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. God's adversary then does exactly what God would have him do. He goes and he defeats Israel. They take possession of part of Israel and they serve the king of Moab for 18 years. You think the Trump presidency has been long. 18 years they are serving a foreign king. We read in verse 15, then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. I'm grateful that as a congregation, you're reading through the Bible in a year. It's a very good habit to get into. I would commend it highly. And one of the things that you will find as you read the Bible and as, uh, as you become more familiar with it and certain parts of the Bible come to mind as you're reading other parts, please know that's a really good thing. It doesn't mean that you have ADD. It means that you're becoming a better Bible reader. And one of the things that as we read the first half of verse 15, we immediately notice not what the writer says, but we immediately notice what the writer doesn't say. There are things that are missing. For example, we don't read anything about repentance. We don't read anything about, and the people gathered before the Lord as one and said, we have sinned against the Lord. We have rebelled against him. You know, as you've read through the Bible in a year, that there are places in which that has happened that Israel, led by her elders, gathers together as one, and they cry out to the Lord, and they acknowledge the ways in which they have sinned against him. But here in the book of Judges, we don't see that. No, we understand that they don't like their circumstances. We understand that they want their circumstances to change. But what about their lives? They're not willing to take any kind of responsibility. They're not willing to acknowledge or to confess or to repent that they did again what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now again, this is one of the places where I fear the book of Judges uh, hits a little too close to home. How often do we look at our own lives and we look at the circumstances that are attendant to our lives and we stand before God and we ask him whether or not he really knows what it is that he's doing? God, don't you get how awesome I am? I don't think you do because if you did, the circumstances of my life would be very, very different. 
We complain to the Lord. We cry out to the Lord because our circumstances are not to our liking. Strangely, sometimes I think it's because we have bought into the heresy that says God is there to give you your best life now. Friends, our best life is not here and now. It can't be. Our best life will be in the new heavens and the new earth. And yet we stand before God like spoiled three-year-olds. And we want him to change it. We never once stop and say, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. We never once stop and examine our own lives. We never won't stop and examine the fact that as fallen sinners, we are, in the words of the hymn writer, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. G.K. Chesterton was an English writer. Uh, I would encourage you to read some Chesterton. He's terribly witty, but in a very British way. Right? So if you like British humor, you will love Chesterton because honestly, I think the man invented British humor. Uh, if you love Monty Python, just know there would be no Python without Chesterton. Some of you just got frightened away. That's all right. Uh, Chesterton, there was a, a series of articles that the London Times was running. Now remember, this is when people still read newspapers and the newspaper would print not once, but three times a day. And so on Saturday evening in the London Times, they were running a series of articles entitled, What's Wrong with the World? They asked eminent peoples to give, excuse me, to give their reasons for what's wrong with the world. Now let's understand too, this is at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. World War I has not happened yet. And so what's wrong with the world? See, they, they actually have this foolish idea that humanity through technology could sort of fix it. And so in response to this, Chesterton wasn't asked to write, but he writes a letter to the editors and says this, my dear sirs, in response to your question, what's wrong with the world? I am. Sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. Friends, we must learn the lesson of Israel in the judges. What's wrong with the world? We are. We are. It does us no good to shake our fist at God and beg him to change our circumstances when what God really wants is to change our lives. What's wrong with the world? I am. Secondly, then, we see God's amazing grace. We see God's amazing grace. Look at the second half of verse 15. And the Lord raised up for them a deliverer. And the Lord raised up for them a deliverer. Now, that immediately begs the question why would God do this? They're unrepentant. They've done evil, and they can't even acknowledge the evil that they've done to the Lord. Why? Why is God sending them a deliverer? Well, as we think about that question, I want to suggest to us that we need to be very happy, and we ought to be thanking God that that is indeed the case. That God's sending a deliverer is not in any way preconditioned by our being repentant or sorry or our confessing what it is that we have done against him. The Apostle Paul picks up on this idea, doesn't he? In the text that Jared read for us in Ephesians chapter 2, you remember the opening words? Turn there. Turn in your Bible or uh, turn on your phone or in your iPad or however you're accessing God's word. Turn with me again to Ephesians 2. And you were, Andrew warmed you up. What's the word? Dead. Dead. Now again, in Chestertonian and in Pythonian 
uh, humor, note, he doesn't say mostly dead. He doesn't say mainly dead. He doesn't say dead except for the ability to cry out to the Lord and repent. No, he says that we are dead. Amen. Friends, let me ask you a question. Uh, what do dead people do? Nothing. My wife, uh, I can tell this story because my son's here and he knows not to tell stories uh, when mom's not around. My, my wife, we've been married 25 years. She's a sweet lady. Uh, you will look at her and know that God is gracious. And, uh, and as a friend of mine in college said, I give all men hope. Uh, she is beautiful. My, seriously, my wife, you, you would be like, how? Like, how? You're a big, furry idiot. How? Um, the Lord is gracious. That's all I can say. Uh, we hadn't been married very long, and I was invited. Uh, Amy was finishing her undergraduate degree, and so we'd been married about six months, and I was invited to her Uncle Ehrman's funeral. Now, Uncle Ehrman went to a general, bab general primitive Baptist church uh, back in, uh, in what's roughly Shepherdsville, Kentucky. So this is a rural church in Kentucky. So you should be hearing dueling banjos right about now in your head, right? That's the picture that you should have. And it was, it was my first exposure to this kind of primitive Baptist preaching. It was my first exposure to a Kentucky funeral. And the preacher, as he was there, uh, started, and uh, he would preach like this. And he was very concerned, it seemed to me, uh, for the salvation of Ehrman's family. Because the, the, the pulpit is, or the, excuse me, the, the coffin is down here, and he comes down at one point, and he's got, you know, he's got the handkerchief and the whole thing, and he's down, and he's sweating, and he's hollering. And at one point, he starts beating on the coffin. And he's telling the family that they're a bunch of fornicators and a bunch of drunkards and a bunch of everything else. And if, Unc if, Unc if Uncle Ehrman were alive today, he would tell you to repent. Well, I thought, you know, somebody, I, wouldn't it be great if Ehrman could just sort of sit up and say, can you keep it down, right? Like, I'm, I'm, this is my funeral, I'm dead. Have a little bit of respect for me. But of course, Ehrman didn't do anything, and he didn't do anything because he's dead. He's waiting for the Lord. Uh, maybe. I fear it's a little warm where Ehrman is. This is amazing grace, though, isn't it? That God sends a deliverer to unrepentant people. In fact, not only are we not repentant, we're dead. We're dead in our sin and in our trespasses. We are by nature children of wrath. I love Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God. Amen. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Our God sends a deliverer to unrepentant people. Well, the deliverer he sends, though, is a rather unlikely one. And this evening, I fear that we have a choice to make as well, and the question is this, are we going to accept God's deliverer as unlikely as he might be? Or are we going to fashion one of our own choosing, our own making, and to our own liking? Now, one of the things that happens is we read Old Testament narrative, uh, and, and I, I yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of tough sailing when you get introduced to someone who has a doctrine in preaching, because then if you stink at preaching, they're going to know that the gig's up, and it's sort of a, it's kind of a no-win thing. But I did do my doctorate in, in Old Testament narrative and in preaching Old Testament narrative. And one of the things that's true as you read through the Old Testament, particularly as you read the narrative sections, is how the author tells the story 
is as important as the quote-unquote information that the story conveys. The author shapes the story in a particular way. And at this point in the story, from the last third of verse 15 until the end of chapter 30, or excuse me, the end of verse 30, the writer of the book of Judges slows down. And he tells us a bunch of things that we're left wondering and we're left thinking, particularly in our easily triggered culture. I think I could do okay not knowing that. Now, if you have a, say, for example, 11 or 12-year-old son, uh, the idea that the dung came spilling out of him is a really cool thing, and you want to use that. But for the rest of us, it's like, uh, I don't know that I needed to know that. So why? What's going on? Well, in slowing down and telling us the story in this way, the writer is using irony. He wants to point out for us that in some sense, this story is comedic. This is a victory through subterfuge and stealth. This is an odd way to deliver God's people. Now, their deliverance is complete, but it's not quite the done thing. It's not what we're going to see later on in the book of Judges. Samson's story is just wicked cool. His hair grows back. He pushes down the pillars and everybody dies, Samson included. But you couldn't make a movie out of Ehud. This would be a rotten screenplay. He straps a short little double-edged sword to the inside of his right thigh, tells the king of Moab that he has a secret message from God for him, which I guess he does. And then when everyone is left, stabs him in the belly, and the man is so grotesquely obese that he can't remove the blade. And then, uh, as we saw, the dung comes out. Some translations say his entrails come out. And by this... Israel is delivered. And if that wasn't ridiculous enough, you have the whole thing about they're locked on the roof and they know maybe he's in the bathroom. They're not sure. This is an odd way to deliver God's people. Ehud, uh, who is a Benjamite, is left handed. Benjamin, the word Benjamin literally means son of my right hand. Ben, son, Ahamin, my right hand. The guy from the tribe of the right hand is left-handed. He's telling us very subtly that this whole thing is just about a half bubble off plum. It's a strange way to deliver God's people. Have you ever noticed when you read the Gospels, and by the way, congratulations, you've gotten to the Gospels now, and you're read through the Bible in a year, uh, but just pay attention when you read through the Gospels, how many times people take Jesus aside to try to correct him. Notice how many times they're stunned that he's doing it wrong. Remember Peter's words <laughs> repeatedly to Jesus? Hey, I, I, I don't think you know what you're doing. Really? Feeding 5,000, raising a dead man, raising Jairus' daughter, healing the Shunammite. I mean, that's not enough for you. You're going to pull him aside and say, hey, wait a minute. I don't think you understand this whole Son of God, Messiah thing quite right. But they do. And it isn't just a problem in the Gospels. Remember what the Apostle Paul says about the Gospel. He says that it's foolishness to the Greeks and it's a stumbling block to the Jews. Friends, this idea that God sends an unlikely deliverer to his unrepentant people isn't just something that we see in the book of Judges. No, it's something that is at the very heart of the gospel itself. Jesus was an unlikely deliverer. Read Isaiah 52 and 53. He was not the king they were looking for, but he was indeed the king they needed. We have that temptation, don't we? 
Now, we church it up. We say things like this. Well, you know, I like to think of God as, or I like to think that Jesus, dot, 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 usually trying to find some loophole to explain away our own sin and our own hard-heartedness and our own just general stupidity. I love the words of J.I. Packer. Packer writes this, when I hear people say, I like to think of God in such and such a way, Let it be said loud and clear that this I like mindset guarantees that all concepts of God that we form by our speculation and wishful thinking will be seriously wrong. Friends, if Jesus cannot surprise you, if Jesus in the gospel does not seem a bit strange to you, then I want to suggest to you respectfully and lovingly this afternoon that the Jesus that you think you have hold of is not the Jesus of the Bible. He's a Jesus of your own making. He's a Jesus of your own speculation and your own wishful thinking. That's why the Lord's table is so important. That's why communion is such a big deal. See, communion allows us to do two things that we've already realized uh, the Israelites are in short stead of. One, communion is the opportunity to come before the Lord and to cry, we are not worthy for the grace and mercy that you have shown us. It's an opportunity to examine ourselves. Now, by the way, when you're done examining yourself, you know what you're going to figure out? You're still not worthy to come to the table. That's the point of God's grace. But we're also told that when we come to the table, we are to remember. We're to remember the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to remember his shed blood. We are to remember this Messiah and this gospel that was foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Gentiles. Friends, the Lord's table is one of the ways in which God reminds us of his unlikely deliverer and he reminds us that we are unworthy of his deliverance. You see, the table is all about God's grace. We have holidays coming up. Some of you, those are wonderful things. Some of you, those are times that are, yet again, should carry their own trigger warning. I like family dinner. We have a large table at our house. I like when my siblings and I uh, can gather around it. And the thing I really like about it is uh, you don't get to that table by merit. You get to that table by birth. That's what family dinner is about. Friends, this evening, it's time for family dinner. You don't come because you've earned it. You don't come because you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, Jesus likes you. No, you come because of God's grace. You come because an unlikely deliverer had his body broken and his blood shed so that you who were dead in your sin and in your trespasses would be made alive together with the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for your grace. Lord, would the words of of Martin Luther ring in our ears that the Christian life is firstly about repentance, secondly about repentance, thirdly about repentance. And Father, even as we examine ourselves, And even as we remember the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, make us mindful of your grace. Make us mindful that we come to the family table not because we've earned it and not because we deserve deserve it, but because the Spirit of God indwells us and we cry out to the glory of God, Abba, Father. So, Lord, as we make this most basic and beautiful confession, you are our God and we are your people. Would it be to the glory of your name, the building of your kingdom, and the strengthening of your blood-bought saints? We pray this now in Jesus' name.
Amen.